Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Today we are going to be taking a look at the congressional powers. So obviously we have learned about these uh, a little bit in class, but we are going to do a little bit more of a deep dive to specifically what powers are given to our congressional body in the House and the Senate through the constitutions, uh, several types of powers. So to start off, let's do a little bit of review. Delegated power is obviously one of our types of powers that are given uh, from the Constitution. There are three types of delegated power, however. So I want you to think now, uh, maybe pause this video, and you are going to uh, go ahead and answer this question. Think of the three types of delegated power and maybe define them as well to give yourself a little bit of a challenge. So you can go ahead and do that now. All right, hopefully you were able to uh, recall those from our previous unit. We brought this up in federalism. So to review as a class, the first type of delegated power is expressed power, also called enumerated. These are directly written powers from the Constitution that are given expressly to Congress, so Article 1, Section 8. They are directly written to the Constitution and can be uh, applied from the text itself. Secondly, we are going to have implied powers, and this is where our necessary and proper clause comes in, also called the elastic clause. And basically what these implied powers do is they read between the lines. They make connections to the expressed powers and anything that is reasonably connected or can be uh, reasonably discerned from our expressed powers are going to fall within the bounds of our elastic clause. So Congress can stretch its power, thinking of the elast or elastic nature, to do what is necessary. Lastly, we're going to have our inherent powers. And these are powers, like we have said, that all governments have. They are inherent to all types of government. Uh, so things like regulating their borders, um, bringing uh, people in and out of the country, and a few other types of things that we're going to discuss as well. So hopefully you got all of those in our little review. The first type of power that we are going to talk about within Congress is what uh, is very commonly called the power of the purse. So this is taxing power and spending power. And this goes into a couple of different areas. So Congress has the power to levy taxes. And this is a very historical measure of all legislatures throughout the world. So this starting with our English Bill of Rights, that's where we really saw this uh, consolidation of taxation power in the legislative branch. Hopefully that's a little review from world history for you. So Congress has the power of the purse to uh, generate what we call revenue. These are laws that raise money for the government so that the government can then reallocate and spend that money where it is necessary. So this is essentially how they uh, have an income, uh, for lack of a better term. This is Congress's income is through tax and different revenue bills. Congress also has the power to borrow money. Uh, so taking money um, from different entities, uh, such as other countries, um, et cetera. So you can uh, borrow um, and loan money. Uh, Congress can also control the coining and printing of money. So And this coining and printing of money is called our currency power. So the power to control currency, both by how it is coined and printed, but also its distribution and laws about its use. Congress also has a very interesting role in the economy in its regulation. So as we know, Congress is not directly involved in regulating the economy as the United States does have what is called a free market economy. And this means that for the most part, the economy is allowed to regulate itself through uh, different measures of buying and spending, supply and demand, et cetera. It's much more complex and we'll talk about this later in the year. But just to cover a little bit of how Congress's 
taxation power does have a little bit of influence over the economy because by taxing specific goods, they can control the buying and selling, the supply and the demand just a little bit. They also have a lot of influence through tax taxation of uh, importing and exporting goods. So goods that are imported to the United States uh, they are all taxed for the most part by Congress. They'll uh, generate revenue that way. So this is another way that Congress can control and has some measure of influence as to what people are buying by how much they're taxed and that controls uh, and influences the price of the goods that are then being sold to consumers. So if that's a little bit confusing for you, that's okay. We're going to talk about this uh, in much more detail a little bit later in the year, uh, but that's just kind of a basic overview. So to put this into perspective for you, uh, to kind of uh, talk about how Congress's taxation power could really have influence over what you buy, theoretically, if there was a 25% tax on all Nike sneakers, right, or Adidas or substitute any brand that you like, would you be more or less likely to buy them? So to put this again into perspective, if there's a 25% tax on Nike sneakers, that is then going to make the price of the good go up. The consumer, the producers, Nike, right, or whatever sneaker brand you want to substitute in here, they are going to have to pay um, certain amounts of tax to get this good into the country, and then the person who is selling the good is going to then raise the price to make up for that. So or so if you have to pay this tax, um, essentially, because you're paying more for the good, would you be more or less likely to buy something because it is expensive? So hopefully you got to answer that question. Just think about it a little bit. To put this into perspective on a graphic curve here, this is what's called the LaFaire curve. And this is something that you use pretty commonly in macroeconomics. So to talk about this um, tax rate down here, if we look down on our x-axis, this is a tax rate of 0 to 100%. So Congress will then control that tax rate of certain goods. They can control how much revenue is charged or how much um, money is charged for certain goods. So then what would then happen is the more that you charge on a tax rate, the less likely people are or the less money that people are going to make because people aren't likely to buy that good, right? If you're charging 80% tax on something, someone is going to make less money, right? This region of declining revenue, the companies are going to make less money, not because um, they're not getting that money from taxes, but because people are less likely to buy that good. However, if we go back down here, so this is like a 10% tax, if you are only charging that much, people are much more likely to buy that good because it's not as expensive. So therefore, you're reaching this growth maximizing point and this increasing revenue region uh, where even though you are taxing a good amount uh, and you're raising that tax revenue, people are still likely to buy that good. So you're going to maximize your revenue in taxes and not yet dissuade people from buying that good. Okay, so this is how Congress can really control how the supply demand. Um, they can also control revenue in that way. So that's a pretty interesting way that Congress interacts with the economy, even though they aren't directly related. Next, we're going to talk a little bit about commerce power. So the Gibbons v. Ogden Supreme Court case we talked about in our textbook a little bit, but this is a really landmark Supreme Court case because its eventual decision essentially decided that this interstate travel, this interstate commerce was within Congress's power to control. So Congress has power to not only control commerce in terms of money, but they also have a lot of power in transport, travel, and the sale and purchase of other commercial goods, especially interstate, right, between the states. So this commerce power is definitely one that's very influential for Congress. So this foreign and national defense policy is something that Congress is very active in, but this is a shared duty with the president. 
So obviously, as we are going to learn later in the year as well, the president is our commander in chief. We've referred to him this way before. So that means he is the head of the military and the executive executive branch. So the president does usually take the lead on a lot of foreign and national defense policy with his other cabinet members, his heads of office, as well as our military leaders. But Congress has a really influential role in foreign policy power, uh, not only because they uh, make a lot of law concerning this, but because they have the ultimate power to declare war and to influence conflicts in this way. So this was not always the case. Congress did not always uh, expressly have the power to declare war and that the president did not always have to go through Congress. This was developed during the Vietnam War during the 1960s and 1970s. So if you are not familiar with the Vietnam War, again, we'll continue to talk about it and bring it up throughout the year. This is one of Ms. Robinson's favorite topics. But the Vietnam War was really influential because it was very, very costly and there was not a lot of public support for it. People were very critical as to why we were in this conflict in the first place. So the president had declared war in Vietnam and there was a draft for soldiers. So people were being drafted or uh, basically forcefully in, inducted into the military to fight on behalf of the United States. So if you were drafted, you did not have a choice. So people obviously did volunteer, but many were drafted during the Vietnam War because there was such little public support. So after the Vietnam War, what the, was decided in the US government was that the president really shouldn't have the power to do this because this is only one individual. And Congress is a much more representative sample of the United States. There are much, uh, there's a much larger base of people who can make that decision, a lot more of a diverse set of elected officials from all of our 50 states, rather than placing this power in one individual, which had really gotten us into the Vietnam War situation in the first place. So this is one of the major legacies of the Vietnam War is that Congress now takes point on official declarations of war. The president has to notify Congress within uh, 48 hours of any major military decision. So that is definitely one way that Congress has a huge impact in our foreign relations. So to continue this, Congress also has a power to provide for our nation's growth. So this is admitting new states. We've talked about our different enabling acts and acts of admission. Uh, they also have the power to govern territories. So we also talked in class about Puerto Rico. So Puerto Rico, even though it is not a U.S. state, does have a representative in Congress who gets to um, kind of sit in, listen, and uh, be aware of what's going on in our lawmaking bodies. Congress is also in charge of naturalization, and this is the process of becoming a citizen. So you can see over on the right hand side here, this is a naturalization ceremony where people who are desiring to become U.S. citizens will take a test and then they go to this naturalization ceremony and officially take the oath to become a U.S. citizen. Congress is in charge of that process. They regulate the testing, uh, the different steps that people have to go to to become a U.S. citizen. Lastly, Congress also is in charge of all of the different uh, federal buildings. It's upkeep. They allocate funds to uh, keep up the different parks, um, including our National Park Service. Our um, state and local parks do receive money, um, but that obviously goes um, through the state funding, um, usually in the forms of different grants and block funding. So government buildings, especially like federal buildings, federal parks do uh, have fall under the control of the U.S. Congress. They make rules regarding not only their budget, but the different rules of entry, et cetera. If you buy a national park pass, that is where that money is going. They're going through the National Park Service, but that falls under the, uh, the watchful eye of our Congress. Next up on our list, Congress has a huge amount of influence over choosing our president, uh, not really in the actual election portion, but more in the certification of the votes after they have been cast. So Congress certifies the electoral college votes after they have been chosen by each state. So the state determines its popular vote and then the electors are awarded in each state. Then each state will submit its electors votes to Congress to be certified. So at that point, congressmen can either choose to certify or reject um, or even question the electors from each state. So they will, um, they can 
question either individual electors, right, individual votes or the actual submission from the state as a whole, which then the state will have to go back and certify and resubmit. The Congress also has a pretty influential role in presidential succession. So this is under the 25th Amendment. So let's take a little bit of a closer look at that. Presidential succession is essentially what happens if the president were incapacitated or somehow unable to serve in his role. So this could either be that the president has been uh, assassinated, which we hope never happens or they are in other ways unable to serve. So this is a line of people that will eventually succeed or will come up and be asked to come up and serve as the nation's president um, if either the acting president or the person above them and is unable to do it. So obviously the vice president is first in line. That is essentially his or her most influential role is to serve as the next president if the current president is unable. Next, we have the Speaker of the House. So this is the head of the majority party in the House of Representatives. Currently, as this video is being filmed, this is Nancy Pelosi, but that um, is going to, that could change depending in the future. Third is the president pro tempore of the Senate. So this is um, somebody who is chosen to um, in the Senate um, to be ahead of the Senate and to serve um, as the president um, if, again, the vice president and the speaker on our eight are unable. Fourth is the secretary of state who is a member of the president's cabinet. The secretary of the treasury is fifth. So those are our top five. But over here on the right hand side, you can see that this is an exhaustive list and it's even cut off at the bottom. This is a pretty much unending list and it goes down through most of the major department secretaries. Um, as you can see, we have secretary of treasury, defense, attorney general, the secretary of the interior, agriculture, right? A huge exhaustive list because if there were some national disaster, we would never want there to be a power vacuum or essentially nobody to serve as president or to serve as acting president until we could put someone in office. So again, this is um, a lot of these uh, people, how this connects to Congress. These are people um, that serve within the Congress, right? The first few are the Speaker House and the Senate or the president pro temp of the Senate. So obviously Congress has a pretty huge connection to presidential succession here. So next are going to be our implied powers. We have gone through our express powers and certain powers, as we discussed, are implied, meaning they are what? They are not written into the Constitution as a power of Congress. And a pretty great example of this is the draft. So going back to this concept, as we discussed a little bit earlier in this lecture, the draft is something where Congress has power over the military and they have the option to initiate a draft. Congress also has a set rule that people are required to, if you are um, a male at the age of 18, you can sign up for the draft if there ever were to be another draft in U.S. history. Um, initiating a draft is not specifically in the Constitution, however, as this is one of our implied powers. However, this is reasonably related to this war power that Congress is designated as an express power, meaning that it is implied, right? It falls within the bounds of the necessary and proper clause or our elastic clause. This is a place where Congress stretches its power a little bit to include this topic of the draft. Impeachment is a process of formal accusation of misconduct in office. And obviously, when we talk about impeachment, we usually are talking about the president of the United States. But there are many different govern government officials that can be impeached. So this formal accusation of misconduct usually involves uh, violating an oath of office, but it comes in two steps. So the House of Representatives and the Senate are each responsible for a specific por portion of this impeachment process. The House votes to actually impeach. So they can conduct an investigation of wrongdoing and then decide and vote whether or not to impeach a president. And impeachment does not mean removal. That's the major concept I want you to kind of grasp here is a president can be impeached and not leave office. Senate uh, is where the president can be removed from office. So the Senate will conduct a trial in order to remove a president if they are impeached by the House. So impeachment is basically just a censure, a process of saying, yes, the president has done wrong and they have violated their oath of office in 
such a way that we have explained. And this process of impeachment also prevents the president from pardoning himself or herself or from future presidents pardoning that president that was impeached. This is a pretty lengthy process. It doesn't usually happen very quickly. And they also need a pretty solid majority to convict and remove a president from office. Next, this confirmation power. Uh, this is a process where the Senate can approve presidential and Supreme Court appointments. Uh, usually, Supreme Court appointments uh, are under some scrutiny, as we have seen in the re recent past. And the Supreme Court uh, appointments overall, the Congress has rejected about 20% of them. So the president who then nominates the Supreme Court, this member of the Supreme Court, um, will have to go back and nominate someone else and go re-go through this process. So this is a process where the Congress has some control as to who enters the judicial branch. Next, we have the ratification power of Congress. Congress has the power to ratify treaties with other nations. So a ratified treaty will require a two thirds vote of senators. So if a president in the executive branch seeks to make a treaty with another nation, he has to get approval of the Senate through that two thirds vote. Recently, uh, in more recent years, executive agreements have become more common. Um, so this is a um, executive orders obviously are a little bit different, right? Executive orders deal mostly with um, domestic policy, executive agreements are sort of like unofficial treaties. So just to uh, designate that difference there, executive agreements are more common in recent years just because they don't require that vote of the Senate, because in recent years, there has been a lot of party differences between presidents and the Senate. So usually there has been a difference in party politics between the two. So it's been harder to get those things passed. Next and finally, we have our amendment power. So our amendment power of Congress, uh, we have talked about this process in the past when talking specifically about the text of our Constitution. Congress has the power to propose amendments to the Constitution. This proposal process is then followed by a ratification either by state legislatures or by the special state conventions. The 21st Amendment is the only one that has gone through that process that wasn't actually ratified by the state legislatures. Um, it went through that convention process. That's the only time that has happened in the past. So this wraps up our powers of Congress. Hopefully you were able to see some parallels between our powers here and what you have read in the text. If you have any future questions, please feel free to reach out to Ms. Robinson. I'd be happy to answer those questions for you. And very nice job.